and I hope that the, that the Senate talks about that. But that's just the, uh, the uh, requirements of being a Supreme Court justice that are usually pretty easy to meet. You know, usually finding people who uh, have the right judicial temperament uh, and who are not ethically challenged are, are you know, pretty easy to do. Um, the harder one these days, unfortunately, uh, is no less fundamental, though. And that is, if you're going to be a Supreme Court justice, you have to understand what the job of a judge is, right? We wouldn't nominate somebody, we wouldn't uh, elect somebody to be uh, president if he really didn't like the legal constraints that we put on being the president, right? Uh, we wouldn't vote somebody to be a member of Congress if this person sort of avowedly said, well, you know, there are all these rules about what congressmen are supposed to do in the Constitution. I really don't like them. I want to do something else when I become president. Uh, I want to do something that the Constitution doesn't really uh, allow for. That's my idea of what a president should do. Why is it that we're willing to accept people as judges who are quite upfront in saying that, you know, this idea that the framers had for what judges are supposed to do is not really something that I'm comfortable with or that what I want to do. I have a very different idea of what a judge should do. Now, you know, the phrase judicial activism uh, gets thrown around a lot, and I think there's a lot of deliberate misinformation or disinformation um, uh, about what the definition of a, of a judicial activist is. Uh, but it's really very simple. Judicial activism is when a judge substitutes his or her own policy preferences for what the text of the law actually says. Or to put it the other way, what judges are supposed to do is look at what the law says, the Constitution or statute, uh, and then apply it to the facts of a case before them. They are supposed to follow what the text of the Constitution or the statute says. They aren't supposed to distort it or ignore it or rewrite it uh, or add to it or take away from it because they have a different idea of what they think that text should say. And that's all there is to it. And if a judge decides that he doesn't like a law that Congress has passed or a state has passed, and so that therefore he's going to make up something in the Constitution that makes that statute unconstitutional, that's judicial activism. But it's also judicial activism if Congress uh, passes a law or there is a provision in the Constitution that makes something very clear and the judge decides that he doesn't like that law or doesn't like that constitutional provision and that therefore he's going to ignore it. So. You can be an activist by adding something to the Constitution that isn't in there, or you can be an activist by taking something out of the Constitution that isn't there. You know, either way, the judge is making up law. Okay? There is a lot of reason for the Senate Judiciary Committee to be very concerned that what we have with Judge Sotomayor is a nominee who is very upfront in her belief that this is something the judges should do. That simply having a disinterested, uh, text-driven view of what the law is, is not really something that she is comfortable with. That the way that a judge rules is not determined just by the text of the law in front of him or her, but by that person's life experiences and by that person's um, you know, own view 
of what kind of law is needed. And the reason that we're concerned about this is not just some of the opinions that she's written, but a lot of the speeches that she's given and a lot of her uh, extrajudicial writings that make it pretty clear that this is a judge who believes that the judicial role is not something that is bound by the written law uh, that they are supposed to be following. Now, I don't want to um, uh, go on for too long because I, I know there are some, um, some interesting um, uh, questions that we'll get from the audience and also some, some points that we need to, to talk about um, you know, among ourselves. But I do want to make it, uh, I, I do want to talk about this New Haven firefighters case as a, a classic example of why we should be concerned. But you know, in doing that, I, uh, I, I first want to acknowledge, uh, you know, that Kurt is quite right, that it's not just in, that, in, just in the area of affirmative action and racial preferences that there's reason for concern. Uh, we, we have reason for concern uh, with regard to the Second Amendment. We have reason for concern with regard to property rights. We have reason for concern with regard to campaign finance law. Uh, there are a lot of red flags out there, and you would expect that. I mean, if a judge thinks that, as a general matter, that it's okay to, uh, uh, you know, add things to the law or take things away from the law, we wouldn't expect the judge to do that just in one particular area. You know, we would expect this to be part of a pattern, and indeed, you know, we've, we've seen that. But, again, I think Exhibit A is, is what happened in the New Haven Firefighters case, and one reason for that is that... Um, you know, this is an area, uh, if we expected to see judicial activism, um, given the centrality of uh, identity politics uh, and identity judging that we see in Judge Sotomayor's um, uh, speeches and, and writings, we would expect to see it in the civil rights area. And lo and behold, that's exactly what we see. What happened in the New Haven Firefighters case was that the city of New Haven um, needed to uh, promote some firefighters. And so it very carefully came up with uh, a test to decide who was going to get promoted. And you know, went to a lot of trouble to do this. This, this was a, a custom-made test that, that they came up with. And they administered the test. Um, and they, they, they needed to promote 20 people. And um, as it turned out, the, the 20 people who scored highest on the test uh, were uh, 18 whites and two Hispanics and no African Americans. Well, this resulted in a lot of unhappiness uh, in the, uh, among New Haven uh, uh, city officials. And they were getting a lot of uh, pushback from the local, you know, Al Sharptons and Jesse Jacksons out there. And so they decided that they were going to throw out the results of this test, that they weren't going to promote anybody because the people who were going to get promoted, promoted who had earned promotions, um, were the wrong color. This included people who'd made a lot of sacrifices in order to study for this test. Um, one of them, the lead uh, plaintiff, Frank Ritchie, was uh, a gentleman who is dyslexic. He had to pay somebody thousands of dollars to take all of the written materials that he had to study, uh, read them onto audio tapes so that he could listen to them, you know, rather than read them. Um, a lot of people, you know, quit jobs, quit, you know, extra jobs that they had so that they would have more time to study. Uh, Judge Sotomayor apparently did not have a lot of empathy for those folks because uh